All right. Well, joining us today, Jeff Amon, co-founder, basis of Pearl Jam, here to talk about his solo project. We'll talk about Pearl Jam and we'll talk about the upcoming Big Ohana Festival coming up, which, by the way, I can't believe it's taken so long for Pearl Jam to headline this event. Yeah. Um, you know, Ed, uh, he maybe talked maybe after the second year about having us come down and play. Um, and at one point, I thought it would be cool if we just showed up and played a song at the end of his set, you know, at, at some point, but, but this is better. So. Yeah, this is, this is, this is like Pearl Jam overload now this year. <laughs> Four shows. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking right now about uh, I should be outside and I'm assuming this is an ode to COVID. Uh, yeah, probably unintentionally. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, the thing that, um, was uh, maybe maybe different, maybe similar to some people. Uh, but at the very beginning of COVID, I, I lost three friends. Like the first, it was there, all in April, um, and that sort of was like in the middle of me starting to record these songs. And so I think that those uh, those three losses sort of um, pushed the the uh, the subject matter sort of maybe down a darker path than what I originally intended, but, um, but it was, it was, you know, sort of a way for me to sort of work through it. So, you, you know, Jeff, I got to tell you, uh, I absolutely love this album and I'm not just saying that cause you're here. I mean, like typically when I do interviews with artists who are in big bands and they go off on their solo projects, there's a reason the solo material doesn't make the band. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Right. Yeah. I, I was floored, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't believe how great this album was. Really, really great. Wow. Well, I, you know, a, a lot of times with my solo projects, at least what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to sort of push it into areas that Pearl Jam doesn't, doesn't wade into. Um, <clears throat> and with this record, it was, you know, I, I, like I, I was working for so long that I just got more and more bold in terms of like how I was arranging songs. Um, not being afraid to put out a minute and a half song, you know, like it's only going to go to the chorus once. I'm going to embrace my inner guided by voices. Um, and so it, um, I, I sort of pushed a lot of the songs that I thought were sort of chances I was taking uh, with this group. And, and that, that, that's, that's been really fun. When we're talking about the musical arrangements, was it all you? I know Matt Chamberlain did a little bit, but was it mostly you? Yeah, I mean, it, all the songs were I, were played and recorded by me initially and then I had uh I had Matt and uh my friend Richard Stuber who played drums on a few things after <clears throat> they, they they basically just played a more dynamic part to my drum loops a lot of times I, I would have like a a drum loop that I might you know overdub a ride or a couple of crashes to just to sort of give it some dynamics but it's it's uh it was pretty hack drums so um it, it was nice to get some professionals to give the song some dynamics. You talk about that genre box. I think what I really enjoyed about this album was I couldn't peg it to a certain genre. You know, it's like, it's like I'd listen to one song and I'd hear like, you know, like this, this British late seventies, new age punk rock. And then the next song would be like, you know, United States punk rock. And then, I, you know, it, it went on the spectrum. It was like, for me, it was almost as if like Adam and the Ants meets Alan Parsons Project meets Dead Kennedys meets the Deftones. You know, am I far off on that one? <laughs> well, that, I mean, that, those are all fantastic bands, so I'll, I'll take it, especially Adam and the Ants. Um, I, you know, I, I think I, I still go back and play those, um, <clears throat> you know, those English post-punk bands, um, you know, like, uh, you know, Psychedelic Furs were like a like that first psychedelic first record, I remember I, I bought it because it was a it was a Sony nice price record and it looked kind of like a punk rock cover. So I I I never I didn't know anything about them, but I bought it specifically because of the artwork. But that record had a huge impact on me. Like that, you know, uh, Richard Butler is such a great poet. Um and uh there, there there's a lot of uh uh sort of religious angst. In his lyrics, um, I mean, there's a real, you know, Bowie, uh, Iggy Pop thing. Uh, totally, totally, David Bowie too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
But um, yeah, I, I gravitate towards that that gothy, you know, post punk stuff. For sure. So let me ask you a question: When you're recording Gigaton, you obviously have this material in your heart. Are you subject to the box when you're recording for Pearl Jam? Do you have to keep it to the Pearl Jam genre? I mean, because obviously you venture out. Gigaton is definitely a departure from typical Pearl Jam. But, uh, but I mean, how do you record Gigaton and still have this material left in you? Yeah, I, I mean, the you know, all this material was written, you know, after Gigaton. But, you know, the, the, you know, the one song that I got in Gigaton is that song, All Right. And that, to me, is like a super departure. And so the fact that that was the song that... Um, Ed was really excited. Ed and Stone both were super excited about that song. Um, uh, that that's like that's like a win for me. Like you know the 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 weirder or the more experimental song that I can get anybody excited about is the the thing that I'm most excited about at this point in the band. Like I I love the experimental part of the band, and I think we're I think we're good at it. I think sometimes we. Uh, <clears throat> We could probably lean on it more, you know, but I think, uh, you know, I think Ed, Ed in particular is such a good, just song writer, like, you know, he can, he can just turn a phrase and, and create a sort of a pop hook and he's such a fantastic poet right now like he's, it's amazing to watch how fast he works and, and how he can pretty much immediately come up with just some cool phrase that um, it's just hooky, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's almost like, have I heard that somewhere before? Like th those kind of lines. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to be bummed when those kind of songs make it on the record. Too. Well, it sounds to me like you're saying like you're even drawing influence from your own band when recording this. Y yeah, I think I, I, I would, I, I think we're all sort of influenced by each other. And, and, you know, I think there's like, it's probably the friendliest competitiveness I've ever witnessed in my life just you know it's um how inspired we are by each other in so many different ways um you know whether it's uh different people's philanthropy or you watching you know how good of a husband or father they are um but you know specifically creatively just when you you know like Stone will record a song like he had a, he had a song on the first painted um what's what's the side project with Matt Chamberlain um painted anyway but there was a song that he played me and I was like oh I wish that was a Pearl Jam song you know and so that that's 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 cool when you know everybody's off doing their their side things and and, and sort of pushing the boundaries of their their individual songwriting have you gotten any feedback from Stonehead or Mike in regards to uh I should be outside yeah, yeah, um, you know, I, I gave them all this the first single, uh, the bandwidth I hear you, and I, I, I got good feedback on both those songs, like bandwidth in particular, I think. Um, um, so I mean, bandwidth is probably the most kind of song, songy, you know, uh, uh, um, on this record. So, um, and and and, the, and those two songs were sort of the, those are the first two that I finished, and they, they were the first ones that had real drums on, and it it sort of gave me like this centerpiece to sort of build this record around um and uh it, you know it helped it helped me you know whenever you can kind of finish a couple things then you can you can really start to feel the momentum happening with any project so those were two important songs i would have to say i think dead ends is my favorite track awesome i love that i love that i love it when people pick like i've heard dead ends a couple times and i heard um somebody said passion denied passion denied, passion denied would be my number two and then somebody said, despite all odds, which I thought, man, that's the, that was like the weirdest, darkest, <laughs> like the, um, it almost didn't make the record, but because I wrote that the day after like a classmate of mine had passed, I, I it had to be on the record just because it felt like the record had this tribute vibe to it. So um, I, I would say at it, when we talked about that David Bowie influence, I would say you hear it the most on Dead Ends. Awesome. That's great. I mean, you know, arguably one of the greatest songwriters, you know, contemporary songwriters ever. So, I mean, and it's, it's, it's especially fun to sort of like try to learn those Bowie songs to learn the parts because um, they're super complicated. <laughs> like his, his sense of harmony and the way that, you know, his arrangement style is just so fantastic. I mean, you don't really even hear that it's every verse is changing every time that it comes around. 
but because of his ability to sort of, you know, change the verse melodies up harmonically, like he, he, he was really ahead of the pack in a lot of ways. No. I, I know you, you know your forte maybe more into the 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 punk scene, especially you know when it comes to your musical taste. Uh, but do you think that all of that was derived from the Beatles sound and the the British invasion? Yeah, I, I think especially later on, you know, when the the Beatles were, you know, uh, they were experimenting more than anybody. You know, I mean, you could you could argue that you know maybe Pet Sounds, you know, was pretty experimental but that, that was still pretty I mean the sounds are pretty experimental but it's still pretty poppy music whereas I think the Beatles got super weird you know I mean you, you know you listen to the last you know starting with Sgt. Pepper's but it, you know you, you you get into the White Album and Abbey Road there's there's some really weird stuff and even the even the super peppy Paul poppy Paul stuff is like weird you know so yeah uh, I mean, you know, you could spend a lifetime, you know, just learning those songs and trying to understand the craft and the and the level of all four of the all four of those guys like were so crazily competent. Um, I, I'm sure you've watched the Rick Rubin, the one, two, three, four, or the yeah, or an Apple, yeah. Man, I mean, why why don't they just keep that going? The, you, you could literally make forty episodes of that thing because they're just touching on really the catalog of, of of that and it's just like to hear paul talk about just give you those little nuggets of what was going on at the time and what they were thinking and how this sound or why they decided to sing this part why these words came out it's like it's just i it, you know i i understand it just because i feel like i touch on elements of that and just how the creative process works but those guys were operating at such a crazy high level. Like it's, it's just amazing to, to get inside of the process. But now do you think that when we take a band like the Beatles at the time that they were experimental with their music, the genre was wide open. I mean, anything they did would be considered new. Whereas opposed to, you know, guys like you and Pearl Jam, you know, like here we are talking and I'm saying, Oh, it sounds like David Bowie. It sounds like Adam the Ants. It sounds, you know, I, I mean, Beatles didn't really get that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I still think there was probably something that was in, inside of them that they were, you know, for some of it was probably the drugs they were taking, but but a lot of it was probably just some weird jazz influence or something they heard when they were a kid. And I, I think it's the same for all of us, but they were, you know, they were the Beatles, you know, like, so not only were every, people were going to buy it no matter what it was, but also it gave them they could just do whatever they wanted to do. They, like they, they got to that point in their career there where they were like, okay, we, we've earned our spot here. We've been the biggest band on the planet for the last five years. We were the first to like, you know, I mean, they were just the first. They were, you know, there's nobody, I don't care, you know, every five years, some English band comes out, Oasis, whoever, and says, we're going to be bigger than the Beatles. It's just like, yawn. Like, are you kidding? Like, nobody will ever... Nobody will ever get to that place again because they were just the first. They were the they were the first to do it the way that they did it, and they got bigger than anybody at a time when, you know, pop and rock music was just a baby. It was just infant, and so, um, you know, it's just so. It, the, the great thing is that they just they just kept pushing the boundaries and pushing the boundaries until they couldn't push them anymore, and then they all went off on their individual ways and <laughs> kept pushing the boundaries like those solo McCartney records are super weird and super homemade and I and I can't tell you how much those kind of records influenced this record for me because it was like oh yeah I can run my own studio I can like and, and people are going to be are going to want to hear these insular home recordings of this time because it's it's a it's a strange time and we need to document it you know with these home recordings and so th that's sort of that's sort of push me to, to finish something and, and make a record out of it. So, you know, you talk about there's never going to be another band like the Beatles, but, you know, f at least for America, Pearl Jam, I mean, obviously you have a world appeal, but I mean, like to be, to be able 30 years later to go out on tour, sell out arenas all over the, the world, sell out stadiums all over the world. I mean, just to think that you could even be in the con same conversation as the Beatles, 
Jeff, I mean, you, you got to pinch yourself sometimes. Yeah, I, I would never put myself in the same conversation as the Beals, but yeah. As, as far as the world, worldly appeal, I mean, everybody knows Pearl Jam. Yeah, I, I mean, there, you know, there's not a day that goes by. Even, even going through this last year and a half, a part of me sort of felt like, hey, man, we had 30 amazing years. Like, how freaking lucky are we? Like, we're, you know, like that we got to play a thousand shows and see the planet and have, and had just have these amazing experiences and play with all these bands and a lot of our favorite artists. Um, yeah. It's like, you know, and again, I'm a small town Montana kid. So like, you know, you know, a lot of times people would say like, man, all your dreams came true. It's like, man, this wasn't a dream. This wasn't even possible. It wasn't even the slightest possibility. So that's not lost on me ever. Like, um, and in particular playing, you know, playing a show last weekend, the first show in three years, like I, that was, that night was not lost on me. I was looking up almost every song and just taking it in and going like, wow, like we get to do this again. This is like, and it might be brief. We might only get to play a few more shows, but we're going to, we're going to get four shows in and I'm going to, I'm going to take it all in. Cause it's, uh, you know, we're really fortunate. Well, I was going to ask you about that because I mean, you know, here you guys, your last full full out tour was the lightning bolt tour. And I believe that ended around like 2016, you know, and then you do the home shows, which was cool. You state select baseball stadiums and, you know, obviously Montana, the, the football stadium, yeah. but, um, uh, but, but then here we hit this pandemic hits and, you know, everything comes to a halt. So, I, I mean, were you itching to get out there? I mean, were, was there something lost that you rediscovered? Well, we, you know, we, uh, we made our first record in five or six years and we were, we had rehearsed for two weeks. Uh, and the day after we finished our last rehearsal, we called, we called off the tour. And so there, there's, there's a lot of disappointment in that. I mean, you know, working so, and we kind of made this last record ourselves and, um, you know, it's, uh, with no deadline really. So it's, there, there was just a, it, it, you know, it's like a pr little bit of a pressure cooker and it's just us. And so we were really proud of the record and we were, you know, two weeks of rehearsals, we finally got the song sort of feeling like we wanted them to feel live. And then, the, and then that the rug just sort of got pulled out from underneath us. So, you know, from a purely selfie standpoint, it was, it was pretty disappointing. Um, but again, like we, we got to play some of those songs the other night and uh, we, we, you know, we made it through the, at least the, this first phase of whatever the hell it is we're going through right now. So. That, that's cool. The, the Atlantic City shows last weekend, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Um, okay, so now Ohana. Have you been to the festival before? Do you know about it? What's what, what do you what, what's the deal? Well, I mean, I mean, we know about it just because you know Ed's been talking about it, and Smitty, who's our manager, um, has a big hand in it. And uh, um, we were supposed to play it last year, and so we were. And I was actually going to go the year before that. Um, and then uh, uh, I can't remember. There's some. There was, I can't remember what band played that, that I really wanted to see. Other than I, I hadn't seen Ed play a solo show in a couple of years. I think um, it was it was Chili Peppers headline that year. It was uh, right. Yeah. right, right, you're right. And I think Jack, I think Jack Irons was there. I hadn't seen Jack in a while. I think that was kind of that was kind of one of the main reasons I wanted to go. Um, uh, but then uh, Robert Plant uh, decided to play Montana. And I got, I, got, I got a call from our our European agent and he said, hey, Robert wants to want you to show him around. So I had to I had to stay. I like I feel like I'm a little bit of like one of the ambassadors to the state. And so, you know, when somebody like Robert Plant comes to, you know, the place where you grew up, where you were listening to the Led Zeppelin records when you were a kid and you get that opportunity to like take him around and tell him a little bit about, you know, the state you have to you have to stick around yeah i don't i don't think it's really, i mean you could see jack any day <laughs> right right um you, you know but but obviously eddie has created quite the vibe when it comes to ohana i mean this it's a it's not like your typical festival and i think yeah. that's what everybody recognizes with ohana what, what are you expecting when you're out there yeah well i you know we've played you know, we've played enough festivals over the years that when you sort of happen upon those ones that feel really special, I think he was just keeping a mental, you know, he was keeping mental notes for, uh, you know, the pros and cons. And they, they basically just took the, 
you know, the list of pros, you know, of the, the great festivals and the great things that happen at festivals. And they just made their own festival out of that. So they kept it small. It's on the beach. There's a, there's a real communal vibe. Um, I mean, that was the thing that, uh, you know, they were asking me, they're like, Hey, any collaborating you want to do, like reach out to any of the band, you know, there's like a real, you know, kind of old school, uh, communal thing going on. So, um, the only thing that makes it tricky this year is we got this virus. So it's like, you, you really don't want to be swapping and spit, uh, creatively with anybody or too much. Um, so we're, 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 we're going to be a little bit in a bubble in this one, but and Pearl Jam still hasn't rescheduled those shows those the, from the arena tour. So, I mean, for all intents and purposes, these outdoor shows could be the only chance that fans get to see Pearl Jam, uh, at least for, for the for the next few, you know, modern time. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we sort of have some stuff penciled in at different times, uh, you know, over the next six months. So just, we're just hoping that we kind of wrangle this thing a little bit and, uh, you know, people... You know, it's, it's like if you want to do this stuff, you got to get vaccinated. It's just like it's, you know, you got to get vaccinated. You got to test. Um, you just got to be smart. You got to think about your neighbor. You got to think about the people that you're hanging out with. Um, so that, that that's kind of our only that's on, that's our only chance, you know, with this. So so hopefully that happens. And, you know, I mean, in a perfect world next spring, we can we can start playing some more shows. Um, I think we're I think we're sort of rehearsed up enough right now that we could you know, as long as we, you know, play shows within the next six to nine months, I think we could probably at a moment's notice, like get on a plane or uh, get in our car and drive to the next show. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, Jeff, uh, is there anything else you'd want to add? No, no, no. Uh, great, great talking to you. Um, it's great to be in Southern California. It's, win- it's almost winter in the Pacific Northwest. So. Hey, dude, I, I, Southern Cal, you know, I watch, I saw Pearl Jam 20 many times. I mean, Southern California is the reason you're in a band right now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, Jeff Amon, thank you so much for speaking with us, or with at least me today. Normally I have my, my, uh, my brother in law, Ben, here. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's early in Australia. Uh, but uh, I should be outside, available uh, now where music is sold. And of course, you can see Catch Pearl Jam. Weekend one, Sunday night at Ohana, and the Ohana Encore weekend, Friday and Saturday night. Jeff, thank you so much, my man. Appreciate it. We can talk to you. Take care, man. Bye-bye.